A very good morning and welcome to this session titled Education Meets Artificial Intelligence. My name is Nzinga Kunta. I'm a business news anchor on the public broadcast in South Africa, the SABC. And it's my great pleasure to be moderating this discussion, which is going to take a look at the many opportunities presented by artificial intelligence for learning, but also the uncharted risk for learners. Artificial intelligence is said to generate trillions of dollars worth of economic value. And it means that in order to thrive in the future, people need to learn how to live and work with AI, but I think more importantly, learn with and about artificial intelligence. So what are the risks that AI presents for learning and what are the emerging best practices? And how do public and private sector companies adopt to deal with and leverage on this new era of education? To help us understand this topic, I'm joined today by Ahmed Balhul Al Falasi. He's a Minister of Education of the United Arab Emirates. Emilia Stomenova Doch, the Minister of Digital Transformation in Slovenia. Hadi Patovi is the founder and chief executive officer of Code.org and Jeffrey Cha, the Chief Executive Officer of Skillsoft. This session is being live streamed, which means that we have people from around the world watching both in this room and online. If you'd like to add to the conversation, you can use the hashtag WEF24. Thank you so much to our panelists for being here. Minister, perhaps I'll start with you. Can you contextualize the risks and opportunities that AI presents and then give us insight into how you're looking at this and addressing this in the United Arab Emirates? Yes, so I think um, AI, as we all know, will, will affect all sectors and education is not immune to that, right? And I think the, the biggest um, opportunity for any regulator, any country, is to identify any change, embrace it, and make the most out of it. Um, if you go back in history, and this is not nothing, not nothing new. Today we talk about AI specifically, but this has been happening for a long time. If you go back in history, in the late 60s, there were mass teachers protesting the use of calculators. It was a new technology, right? And then scientific calculators. And then we went into, into the internet. We had kids asking us, why should I go to school and I can Google whatever I can read, uh, I mean, uh, find on the, online. That puts tremendous pressure on us as academia and regulators to change the skill sets that we teach our students and to change the assessment as well. So what we have done right now is we are now finding ways to integrate AI into the education system without disrupting it a lot. So we've decided to go with the AI tutor, which would not affect the class uh, the class will be conducted the same way, but if a student does not understand a specific concept, he or she could go to that AI tutor and interact with it. Um, it's built on our own curriculum, so that's something very important for us, that the information is accurate. Uh, we've run tests to make sure it's ethically appropriate. You don't want any biases to be taught to your students. So we actually had a big hackathon with our best hackers in the country trying to ask it the silliest questions, the most appropriate ones, just to see can we ensure that that tool provides accurate information and does not have any biases. Uh, so far, it's been doing really well. Uh, we've also conducted a survey to understand how it's tutoring in the UAE. And we've noticed that eight out of 10 that take private tutoring improve their uh, grades by about 12%. So there's a big opportunity. The final element is the way we're approaching this right now is also to democratize tutoring. Uh, today, you have people from a higher socioeconomic background that can have access to private tutoring. However, the disadvantaged students, A, they don't have someone at home that could explain that concept to them, and two, don't have the means to get a tutor. So by doing this, having a tutor in your pocket, you're leveling the playing field. And I think the success of any educational system lies in its ability to offer socioeconomic mobility of its citizens. Minister Doch, perhaps I'll ask you to also give us insight into the digital Slovenia strategy for 2030 and how it looks at digital competency specifically. Thank you so much uh, for hosting us at this session. Uh, so our Digital Slovenia Strategy 2030 was adopted uh, last year uh, in March. Uh, and of course, digital skills and competences uh, are one of the top priorities. Uh, the biggest challenge that we have in Slovenia at the moment uh, is that half of our population uh, has at least basic uh, digital skills. So our goal is that by uh, 2030, at least 80% of our population will have at least basic 
digital skills. And today we are speaking about AI skills and competences. If we don't have digital skills, then we cannot speak about uh, AI skills. Uh, so we are not discussing only basic digital skills, but also expert skills. So at the moment uh, in Slovenia, we have around four and a half percent uh, of uh, our population that are ICT experts. We would like to increase this share. So our goal is that we will have at least 10 percent of our population. Another thing, uh, in Slovenia, we don't have many women included in the sector. And we believe that uh, uh, this is a lost opportunity because women can be uh, very good ICT experts, uh, also AI experts. So at the moment we have 17% of, uh, of our ICT experts are female. We would like to increase this uh, to at least 25% and to increase the number of people that are involved uh, in uh, STEM. Uh, but as my colleague minister mentioned, AI will not only change our work, our work environment. So we don't don't need AI and digital skills as well only for our jobs. We need these skills in our everyday lives because these technologies are changing the way uh, we are living. That is why not only for me but for our government it is very important that we provide these skills to absolutely everybody, to every citizen in our country. If you want to do that, in Slovenia we have very good public education system. Of course, it's the easiest way to cover everybody if you go with uh, different programs through the education system. But not all the population is involved now. Uh, many of us have finished uh, our school, so uh, we need to provide them the, those skills and competences uh, also. So we cannot only speak about the young people, but we need to include also the adults who will definitely, some of them, will lose their jobs because of these new technologies. We need to provide them the skills that are necessary nowadays. And uh, as mentioned, uh, digital skills and also AI skills are necessary even with the uh, retired people because they also need to know how to use digital public services. They need to understand how AI works, uh, uh, what is this information, misinformation, how these technologies uh, are influencing uh, their uh, daily lives. So uh, a lot of work is going on on digital skills. Uh, it's not only paperwork, so it's not only uh, strategies, but last year uh, we have funded uh, trainings for approximately 30,000 citizens. So we are coming from different countries. I'm coming from a country of 2 million people, which means 30,000 per year is a lot. And uh, we are continuing uh, with uh, this uh, mostly free trainings for our um, citizens uh, also this year and in the forthcoming years. Okay. Mr. Cha, how do you see AI changing how workforce learning happens? Well, the change is huge. Mm -hmm. In the field of workforce learning or adult learning in general, uh, the topic of skills gaps has been the hot topic. It's a big problem around the world. Generative AI is opening up a whole new set of skills gaps when we haven't solved the first problem. In my field, generative AI is changing what we teach and it's changing how we teach, both in profound ways. In the area of what we teach, this is a technology that is affecting almost every job, not just a handful of people in IT. The cloud transformation was a big change. This is gigantic because it affects marketing, it affects sales, it affects operations, it affects finance. Every knowledge worker job will be impacted to some extent, and over time, I believe, we'll see every job impacted to some extent. Mm -hmm. Now, how we teach is also changing at a dramatic pace, and you heard a little bit about democratizing tutoring. In my world, coaching is a way that people grow at senior levels. I would have lost my job many times in my career if I didn't have a coach. But to extend that to every employee in a company hasn't been possible until today. And so now we have the emergence of digital coaches, generative AI coaches, that are incredibly powerful. At Skillsoft, that coach has a name. It's KC Conversational AI Simulator. And what we've launched is 60 real-world simulations. 
everything from delivering a performance review to working with a irate customer to you wouldn't, you might be surprised, but the most popular one is cultivating compassion and empathy. Real world simulations, real world, real time feedback available to everyone. And where this is going is that personal generative AI coach is, I believe, before the end of the year, going to be the new front door to learning instead of a, a search box or something that looks like Netflix for online learning. It's going to be the coach who's going to offer assessments and coaching and hands-on learning and when it's appropriate videos. The world's changing and it's very exciting. Fantastic. Mr. Pachovi, both ministers touched on bias. Uh, Minister Alfarasi speaking about the, the bias that they don't want to impart onto learners, and Minister Duch speaking about the lack of women in the digital space. Now, your company, Code.org, says that there are around 30 million uh, of your students are young women, and the Brookings Institute says that it expects job losses related to AI to disproportionately affect women. There's other vulnerabilities as well that affect women when it comes to AI. How do you believe that these need to be best dealt with going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have a number of thoughts on the topic. Mm. The first is that when people think about job losses due to AI, the risk isn't people losing their job to AI. It's losing their job to somebody else who knows how to use AI. That is going to be a much greater displacement. So it's not that the worker gets replaced by just a robot or a machine in most cases, especially for desk jobs. It's that some better educated or more modernly educated uh, worker can do that job because they could be twice as productive or three times as more productive, mm -hmm. which increases the imperative to teach how to use these tools, to teach with AI, to teach how it works to every citizen and especially to our young people. Uh, when it comes to bias, uh, the, there are many biases, uh, but these are things that we can help teach people to, to recognize. Even without AI, the internet has bias. When you, when you Google, you're not always getting unbiased results. You're getting many different results, and it's up to you to figure out which ones to trust. And teaching students how to distinguish uh, you know, facts from misinformation, how to use critical thinking, how to question their sources. These are part of becoming, uh, you know, digitally fluent. And these are skills that are relevant pre-AI, but even more relevant now in a world as we rely more and more on technology for our education mm -hmm. system. Uh, but when you think about the risks of AI, I think by far the greatest risk of all is doing nothing and assuming that the education system of decades, of really of last century, is going to still be relevant for students today. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, the public education system, if it does not change, is becoming more and more irrelevant. And countries like Slovenia and United Arab Emirates are really leading the way in showing that evolution is the only uh, option, really, for preparing students. And we're excited to be working with both countries mm. in terms of how they, they modernize curriculum. And you work with young people. What's their role in making sure that the AI and the models that we see and the way of learning is impacted by them? Um, well, the first thing I'd say is young people don't view as education as just the education system. Mm -hmm. You know, they go to school, but they also learn on YouTube. They also push the boundaries of what school tells them they should or shouldn't do. When the school tells them they can't use chat GPT, that's probably the first thing they'll go and do because <laughs> if the school doesn't want me to do it, I want to know why. Uh, and so they're experimenting. You know, even though ChatGPT by many schools was banned last year, more than half of all teenagers said they plan on using it to do their homework. Uh, and so it's important to recognize that young people, especially teenagers, aren't just going to do what they're told. They're often going to do what they're told not to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are exploring regardless of what the education system is, is teaching them. Uh, and they're, they're experiencing AI in Snapchat, in TikTok, in well beyond the applications and technologies they, they use in school. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's important is for our school systems to recognize this and be leaders in embracing technology rather than being laggards, because the kids are going to be getting that technology mm -hmm. with or without the school system. Mm -hmm. Mr. Saad, let's come back to you. You have a vast amount of courses uh, teaching AI. What trends are you seeing? Are those changing significantly as the months or years go by? 
Well, well, certainly there's an interest in how to write an effective prompt. Okay, so there's the technology Dang. interest. And there's long been interest in, on the technology side and everything related to AI and machine learning. <clears throat> uh, but what's happening is almost every area of the curriculum is changing. Because there's hardly an area, at least in workforce learning, corporate learning, where AI doesn't have some role. Now, it doesn't mean the whole course becomes about AI, but if you're leading a customer service team, or you're uh, learning how to sell, uh, or you're learning marketing, uh, the, a the courses are changing to reflect AI. Mm -hmm. Okay. Minister Duch, when we're talking about the risks that are there, can you give us more insight into those broadly? And then are there any that you're picking up specifically in Slovenia or that may be related to the people of Slovenia? Yes. <clears throat> I prefer to speak about challenges uh, first, uh, and then I, uh, I will continue with the risk. My personal biggest concern is the uh, exclusion. Okay. when we are speaking about AI in many different topics. Uh, the first challenge I see that it takes some time to prepare good programs. Not everybody is like code uh, and your organization and other organizations that are available. Some people think they prepare good programs and then uh, they let them out in the market and people start learning uh, and the results might not be uh, good. So it's really absolutely necessary that here we collaborate the private sector, the public sector, uh, the countries uh, that we share best practices, lessons learned, uh, what worked well, what didn't work well, and so on and so on. Uh, then another challenge is the people that are out of the education system, as mentioned uh, earlier. I agree completely. Uh, people learn out of education system, not only young people, but also elderly people, but not everybody. We have people that are highly motivated, and we have people that are not motivated at all. Uh, so uh, this is another challenge, how to motivate them to take part uh, in these uh, programs that are available. Uh, then the funding part. So who will fund all these uh, trainings? Uh, of course, the government should do, and uh, we are doing that, but we cannot do that on our own. Uh, in my opinion, the companies should participate there as well. But uh, as the world is changing, we all need to be aware that we need to invest in ourselves, in our knowledge, just like we are investing in food, in uh, clothing, uh, in traveling. Uh, we need to invest in knowledge as well. Uh, then uh, we were speaking about teachers, mentors, coaches. I believe that currently throughout the world, not only in Slovenia, this is Slovenian specific, but also throughout the world, we don't have enough teachers, enough good coaches and enough good mentors. Um, I'm an electrical engineer uh, by profession, <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't think that the people who are developing AI are also good coaches. And on the other side, we have good coaches, we, we have good teachers, but they don't understand how AI works. So uh, what we urge, what is urgently, uh, we need to do something uh, is to find teachers, coaches, mentors, uh, and uh, employ them as much as possible. So um, maybe if we see uh, in the future, uh, if we want uh, the government to fund such trainings, then we, need, then we need leaders who understand how these topics are so important. It's not enough that uh, we are speaking here, but we need also our colleagues, ministers, to understand, our ministers of finance to understand why this is important and how much we can invest. And it's not only the leaders, but also the public administrators, because they are preparing then different measures um, that are going to be implemented in our countries. Then again, really the, the first thing that we need to start working on is train the teachers, train the mentors, train the coaches so that they can share uh, their knowledge uh, later on. Uh, then uh, another uh, thing is um, to really raise trust in these technologies. Just as you mentioned, in the past, it's always like that. When we introduce new technology, uh, then there is a fear, and we're mostly afraid of things that we don't know how they work. Mm -hmm. It's the same with AI. So we need to tell what AI does. AI is not taking your jobs, that somebody who knows how to use AI will replace you, and so on and so on, to really tell them, okay, these are the threats, so you can protect uh, yourself from the threats. 
And uh, this is the only way how people will understand that AI is here, it's not going anywhere. So we need to embrace it, we need to learn how to not only work but live with it. Uh, and uh, the last thing maybe uh, is to make really sure that no one is left behind. I don't mean only by the skills, uh, but also we cannot have AI, we don't have data. So when we are collecting data, we were speaking about biases. It doesn't start with the AI, with the technology, with the algorithms, but it starts with the data. It is really important how the data is collected, uh, who is preparing the models, uh, who is designing the algorithms, and so on and so on. So not only when we are teaching AI, but also everybody that is involved uh, throughout the process, we need to involve everyone. Thank you, Minister. Minister Afalasi, let's continue talking about best practices and lessons that you've learned as the UAE when it comes to artificial intelligence and the intersection with education. Well, look, if, um, I'm not going into the details. I think Jeff, Hadi, and, and Minister uh, covered many topics. One of the key learnings, at least for me, is that when we talk about adopting technologies like AI, sounds fancy and interesting. But the public talks about the basics. They say, look, our numeracy literacy is so low. Why are you bothered with AI? You know, so mm -hmm. there is this, I think, communication that needs to be made that we're using these tools to play catch up. We came to form education very late. My country is as old as this forum, 1971. So you can understand how much time we need to really catch up. So that's why I think part of it is, is explaining to the public why are we really investing in AI in education, uh, and two, for the teachers themselves. We spoke about the um, limitation or the scarcity of teachers. Last thing I want is to give them this perceived risk of losing their jobs and being replaced. We want to empower them. And this is why when we started with the AI tutor, it was outside the class, so don't feel that they are a threat. Now what's interesting is that we've gotten teachers now talking to us saying, can we get access to a teaching assistant? If today this AI tutor is interacting with the student, understanding at what level are they, I would love to get information to be in the form of a teaching assistant. So it was more of a pull as opposed to a push, specifically with education, because I think being an educator, naturally you're perceived as knowing it all. Right. I'll tell you how to learn. I'll teach you. Uh, nobody questions uh, how is it being taught, right? We talk about reskilling. I don't hear reskilling a lot when it comes to educators. Yes, we retrain them on curriculum, but reskilling is a concept that I think we need to really focus on when it comes to educators. In an ideal world, I would love to have technology as as teachers teaching students the basic numeracy and literacy, and then leave the most difficult part, the soft skills, the human skills, you know, to be really doubled down by teachers. We need to free up their time to focus on skills that will matter for humanity and going forward. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds idealistic, but we're getting there step by step. Okay. This is a conversation, and I'd like to move it onto the floor now. If anybody has a question, please may ask that you raise your hand. Let us know where you're from and who your question is. I'd like to get as many questions as possible, so um, fewer comments if possible. Uh, there's a gentleman in the fourth row and there's a gentleman in the first row. We can start with there. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. My name is John. I'm with the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers, and I'm an educator in Zimbabwe with Star Leadership Academy. My question is, um, as the world stands, there's already inequality when it comes to education. How do we ensure that as we continue to implement AI into education, no child is left behind, and we carry each and every child within the process? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Whoever can take it, sure. I think, look, that's a great question. Um, technology makes education scalable, right? So I think that's one way where we can actually ensure that whether it's a good teacher teaching online or it's a, a tutor, these kind of technologies, I think, will really help us scale up. And I think with Africa, the challenge is, like any other country and other continent, the scarcity of teachers. So I think th that will help us, to some extent, address uh, that kind of, from my perspective. We've seen that happen as well in, in energy, right? So uh, there might be countries in Africa where the grid system is not preferred related, but to use renewables to have, you know, isolated power sources through solar and wind and so forth. In a similar way, education could also be used to really um, reach every student and not leave anyone behind. A point to be made uh, on specifically tutoring. A private tutor would cost you a specific amount. We have the numbers in the UAE. 
the AI tutor would be a fraction of that. So even if we were to charge commercially, it will also be much more, um, a pro much more affordable. And I think governments could also invest in that to make sure that we really uplift everyone and not, not leave anybody behind. Thank you. Can I add something? Please. I also believe this is an excellent question. Uh, what we uh, promote in Slovenia is access to the internet. Because access to the internet is access to information and knowledge. So nowadays, and this information as well, uh, but let's keep to the knowledge. Uh, so before, when I was young, I couldn't imagine following a lesson from Stanford or from Harvard or I don't know, name it, uh, different universities throughout the world. All you need now is access to the internet. Many of these courses, of these trainings are available for free or even for some little fee, but you can start there. So I believe that access to the internet should be a human right because then we can address the inequalities in skills, in the access to skills and knowledge as well. I mean, can I add to that? Please. We're working with an incredible organization, I Am The Code, which is teaching uh, mostly young women and girls, but now boys uh, in some of the most disadvantaged parts of the world, uh, refugee camps, uh, the refugee camp in Kakuma uh, in Kenya. And the access is a big issue. And it's the devices. There's a tremendous shortage of devices. And if you go there you, or you see pictures of it or video, you see there's groups of children gathered around one device. So anyone who can unlock and solve that problem can have a huge impact on the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got a second question in the front row here. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pranav Kothari, CEO of EI MindSpark and Adaptive Learning Software. What we are seeing in uh, school grades K-12 is that, you know, how, what are the best methodologies to learn algebra or magnetism hasn't quite enough gotten a research grounding. So for example, we know how to make steel. You follow the template 99 out of 100 times, you'll sort of make steel of the desired quality. But any educator today, when they walk into an eighth grade classroom and are tasked with teaching linear equations or electricity, do not have access to a codified science of education in terms of what can they do so that by the end of the class, more than 80 students would have mastered this, right? So this requires investments in uh, doing R&D, much like how the medical world has done it to come up with medicines to certain diseases. But this is not getting any area of focus, this pedagogy, right? So we've talked about technology, we've talked about inclusion, but those are only things to accelerate once we know how to sort of make sure children master those learning outcomes. Um, so what are like ministries doing in terms of, you know, their universities having a science of learning department, um, as well as when you make courses, you know, how much attention is being paid to pedagogy to make sure that the end of the course, students learn it, uh, because only otherwise the highly motivated adults benefit from it. I, I can take a shot at answering that question. The promise of using AI and technology in education is offering personalized learning for every student. No matter how much learning science you, you look into, one teacher with a classroom of 30 students is not going to be able to deal with different learning abilities, different learning methodologies, and, and serve different things to all 30 students at the same time. But if they have individualized AI tutors, those AI tutors can give one student one method and a different student a different method. Uh, and in fact, we're actually working with Stanford Research uh, on doing exactly this, taking advantage of the latest in learning science to figure out how to personalize and adapt learning to an individual student's uh, learning progression. And that really is only going to be possible using AI being part of the equation as a tutor. Uh, and I don't, this is not something that's available in, in the mass market today, but it is something that you can expect uh, AI is going to bring to education. Um, but the other thing I'd want to add is that when we think about embracing new technology in education, most people think about improving how we teach but they think about the same subjects they learned when they were young. You know, I learned biology and algebra and chemistry and history. Uh, what we don't think about is that our schools should be teaching 
computer science and AI and cybersecurity and robotics, none of us learned these things, or almost none of us learned these things when we were going through middle school and high school. And so we're teaching the curriculum of 50 years ago and not recognizing that the world has changed incredibly in the last 50 years. So in addition to using AI and learning science to improving education outcomes for the curriculum of the past, we should, like the countries here, be modernizing our curriculum to teach the curriculum of the future. And by the way, I wanted to say, you were saying you're playing catch up because your, your country is new. And you know the countries represented here are younger countries. Younger countries have a huge advantage because they don't have a 200-year-old education system that is stuck in the past. Everything in your education system was invented recently. So you're very comfortable being like, well, now we need to improve on it. Whereas in the older countries, Nothing has changed in the education system. Nobody alive has actually <laughs> modified the curriculum recently. So they feel like you can't even touch this thing. It's, it's sort of set in stone from the 1800s. Uh, and so you actually have a huge advantage that are among the countries that are at the forefront of embracing AI and changing the curriculum. I wonder if you can respond. Yeah, so I think uh, that's a very, very good question. I think the pedagogical practices could benefit from more research. Um, I have twins, a boy and a girl, and I still teach them. And they learn so differently. My girl, Haya, is very visual, so I have to explain to her visually, and my son, Mohammed, is very analytical. I have to give him equations. So I've seen firsthand how two siblings learn completely differently. Now, to have this point, the more you interact and the more the technology understands your style, it should adapt the way of teaching. It's not only personal in terms of what content understanding. If you're trying to learn calculus, maybe you still have gaps in your linear equations, that's fine. But how do I teach you? I think there is a lot of room to invest in that. Right now, we're going into the basics, trying to at least get data and see where our students you know, sitting. If you look at the OECD uh, PISA and TIMS results, we're about a year to two behind in some areas of numeracy and literacy. That to me is a big issue. The bigger issue right now is, now you know where students are at, you have a map of them, but how would you teach each dif student differently? And again, to the point about scarcity of teachers, you talk about 30 kids in a classroom, that might increase to 35, which makes the ch uh, uh, task on the teacher much more difficult. So I agreed with you, and I think we really need to double down on that because every person learns differently. And the outcomes are so important, measuring the outcomes. And in my world, we don't, there's no excuse to not deliver outcomes. We have to because companies are paying for it, and so they want to see ROI, and to show ROI, you have to show outcomes. And to deliver outcomes, you have to have thoughtful pedagogy. You have to have research. All right. Um. Hi, uh, my name is Krista Kim, and I'm a cultural leader this year. I'll stand up. <laughs> Hi. We're talking about trust, and I'm wondering how blockchain, decentralized ledger technology with verified sort of authorship of data and education, if you've paid attention to this, because I find that we need to have you know, a layer of trust using blockchain technology that can prove who wrote the data, the information, the articles that are educating our children. And our children are getting a lot of information online, YouTube, you know, just on the internet, we need to know the sources. Who's going to tackle that? I cannot that? agree more with you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not only in primary education, but it's also later on in higher education when we are writing uh, different scientific papers. So who wrote the paper, uh, who reviewed the paper, who was the editor, and so on and so on. So uh, definitely uh, blockchain technologies here uh, can increase trust. But again, um, the problem is, as you mentioned, how public understands. Public doesn't understand what blockchain is. So uh, they need the digital skills to understand what decentralized blockchain and uh, systems are, how, where this data is coming from, and so on and so on. So uh, this is also why I mentioned at the beginning, one of our top priorities is that we increase at least the basic digital skills, because then people will understand how technologies can help them. If I may, I think um, you raise a very, very valid point in terms of the authenticity of the data, but there's a whole separate realm where that comes in handy, which is IP rights. Today, if I'm using a tutor that uses curriculum or any resource, that person has a copyright on that material. 
So I think also blockchain might help us in terms of ensuring that whatever resource we use, we identify not only who the author is in terms of trustworthiness or not, but also their eligibility for a copyright on the material. Uh, because it's very easy to tap into materials today. You have access to everything, but there's also IP rights as well involved. And I think blockchain could help that as well. Right. We have about eight minutes left, and I'd like to take as many questions as possible. Uh, there were two questions in the front here, and there was one question um, in the second row. Please, may I ask the mics to be taken there? Mm -hmm. uh, did you have And that lady there next, next to you. Hi, uh, my name is Eileen, and I'm from Indonesia. Uh, I would like to ask about how AI in the future can help special needs students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a specific oh. person you'd like to answer the question or anyone can take it? Just anyone. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, well, certainly AI, um, as we've talked about the personalized tutor, personalized coach, personalized you know, engagement. Uh, where, when it's personalized and adaptive, we can help a much wider range of learning abilities, both in, the, in children and in adults. And special needs teachers, one of the hardest things in their lives is actually creating individualized education programs for special needs students. Just cr writing the IEP for that student is, is a huge amount of a teacher's time. Uh, one of the f earliest ways AI can help save time for teachers is for the AI to assist in creating that IEP for, for the student. Mm -hmm. So there is a possibility in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, to customize or personalize because uh, special needs are uh, very, it's a very high, different situation. Very different, yeah, yeah under, even under one spectrum. Okay. So can we take the question from the left of the room and then we'll come back to the right of the room here. Please may you go ahead with your question. Is that me? Yes, uh, yes, please. First of all, thank you for all your perspectives. It's really interesting to hear the different points of view. Um, answering Mr. Partovi, um, I uh, live in the United States and it's not that they don't want to touch the education curriculum is that the United States is not investing in education, is at the bottom. And so in order to bring all the points that you're saying and talk about AI and bring all that curriculum, there needs to be more investment. The teachers are open, but they're strained because in the inner cities, you're dealing with a lot of poverty and students that have that are hungry, that don't have parents, that are homeless, and the teachers are dealing with that. There's not enough counselors, not enough um, <clears throat> psychological help for them, and the teachers are dealing with that. Um, teachers are quitting, so a lot of the schools in the inner cities don't have enough teachers. So it's really a question of investing, and then you can, it's almost like a luxury to invest in AI and technologies, and the young people don't have the devices or the internet okay. connection, thank so you. thank you. Thank you for your comment. And if you want to respond, or we can... I'm, I'm happy to respond. I mean, I, I live in the United States as well, and actually 50% of our work is in the U.S. Uh, there's a number of comments I'd say. First of all, in terms of device access, the U.S. is far ahead of most of the world, and even the OECD in terms of device access. Uh, thanks to, this is like the one silver lining of the COVID pandemic, is federal funding increased one-on-one -on -one device access in the U.S. from about 50% of students to 93% of students, which is way ahead of most OECD countries and certainly far ahead of countries like Africa. Uh, so in terms of that, we're actually in a really good place. Uh, I don't agree with that, but let's go ahead with, I mean, it's still much better, but still we're, we're le The U.S. is leading the world in one-to-one -one device access, at least among the larger Africa. economies. Uh, but uh, in terms of investing in education, absolutely we should. The teacher shortage, regardless of investment, is also going to be is a challenge, not only in the U.S., but in many other countries. Uh, but I believe AI has an opportunity to assist with that, because 
part of the challenges with the teacher shortage in the United States and in every country is teachers are overworked. They're, they get paid for a nine to five job, but they're also working at night preparing the lesson plan or grading the homework after school has closed. And AI can actually reduce the amount of time teachers need to spend on basically paperwork outside the classroom so they can spend more time one-on-one -on -one with students, which is why most teachers joined the teaching workforce in the first place. So the promise of AI is reducing the paperwork and administrative workload of a teacher, enabling that teacher to actually do a better job on the thing that they want to do, which is helping students. And I think that's a win-win for everybody. And that's right. true in the United States and in other countries as well. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask to pause there. I think this is a great conversation that can carry on maybe outside of the room as well. I'd like to take as many questions as possible. Please may I ask for a question in the second row here. Yeah, thank you very much for the discussion. I'm uh, Fabian Fiva, I'm a uh, um, parliament uh, of Switzerland. And I have a question. I think the, the, um, one of the problem is misinformation and disinformation, and AI will, um, will further the problem even more than social media did in last year. And don't you think that the basic skills would be to teach the student to, uh, about critical thinking? It's how to research, analyze, evaluate the information, and know how to use it. And not AI is a tool, but what it gets out of this tool has to be critically evaluated. Don't you think that teachers have to teach precisely that to students? Okay. I cannot agree more with you. I will sign under every word you mentioned. 100%. Yes. yes. So critical thinking, uh, thinking out of the box, uh, then information literacy, media literacy, definitely. But we come back to the same challenge. How do you teach critical thinking? You made a very good point. Um, I don't know, I'm electrical engineer. It's very straightforward. Forward. You have a recipe how to teach uh, how current works and so on and so on. How do you teach critical thinking? And if teachers don't have those skills, if they don't have that skill set, how they can then teach the students? Okay. Well, I want just to follow up on please. that. I think that's a great question. When ChatGPT was first introduced in November, uh, there was hysteria in academia. Right, specifically at universities. There was banning of uh, AI. But then we in the US said, let's ensure that our students use ChatGPT and any other large language model. You, if you force them to use it and they come back to class, you then challenge them on what they have read. That's the best way where they achieve two things. One is they will learn how to use that technology because when they graduate, they will use it on a daily basis. And secondly, if they use it to retrieve information, you ask them to challenge that and to present it. So that's, you're hitting two birds with one stone, adopting it, and two, critically challenging whatever outcome comes out of it. Right, we have less than three minutes left on the panel. Uh, I don't know if the last question is going to take 30 seconds or less and the answer is going to take the same time. Um, I'm Ertai Baga, I'm CEO of uh, High Resolves Group. I'll just make a quick comment for 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, as Schwab, um, uh, social entrepreneur. So we've been uh, working with young people uh, on critical thinking, future skills, soft skills for the last 20 years. And there's two things I just wanted to add. On the question of devices, one of the things that I think is an assumption people have is that the end user has to have connectivity, uh, devices, broadband, and what we've been experimenting with is using AI to nanotize the learning and feed it into individual students via SMS, even uh, ras you know, Raspberry Pis, all kinds of things. So you don't actually have to have full bandwidth and everything else at the end to take advantage of the personalization of AI. And, and also the other bit is the AI tools that we've been uh, building probe the personality and preferences of young people. So if a student's interested in soccer or cricket or whatever, the course, the examples are personalized to increase the motivation. Thank you so much for your intervention. I'm not going to ask for a response. I'm just going to wrap up what I think are some of the key takeaways from the panel that we've had today. I think the biggest one is that learning is not confined to a classroom or an age. At whatever age, whether you're in school, university, retired, or in between, learning can still happen, and it's not limited to the classroom, it's not limited to a physical space. 
and the data is so important, what's being inputted, um, avoiding bias, making sure that the mistakes that we've made up until this point when it comes to bias, whether it's gender, race or other, is avoided. And finally, the importance of critical information and critical thinking. I would just like to thank our panelists so much for their contributions, a reminder of who they are. Ahmad Belhul Al-Falasi, the Minister of Education of the United Arab Emirates. Emilia stomenova Duch, the Minister of Digital Transformation in Slovenia. Jeffrey Tarr, the CEO of Skillsoft. And Hadi Patovi, the founder and chief executive officer of Code.org. Thank you so much for your time and thank you so much to the people in the room for your incredible insights and questions. It's really appreciated. It's been a pleasure being your moderator. Good morning.